reading from Psalm 19, verses 1 to 6, and page 552 in the Church Bibles. The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The second reading comes from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 4. You find it on page 1031. <coughs> Jesus rejected at Nazareth. <coughs> Sorry. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. And he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, we're just going to pray for Lee as he delivers the word. So you might want to stretch out your hands and we can pray together. And so, Father God, we, we pray that you may anoint Lee with the word you have given him and that you may ready our hearts. Good morning, everyone. I feel kind of excited and nervous at the same time, because when I came into church this morning, um, I came up and, and, and saw Dean, and uh, Kira very quickly said, oh, your friend, and I went, well, let's not go that far. Um, but it was lovely to, to, to talk to Dean, and I looked at the order of service, and Dean had put down Lee, no, word, Lee in his order of service and I jokingly said to him I thought, do I only get the one word and he says that'd be good um, and then actually we had this little, little joke when I thought actually one word is enough really isn't it Jesus um, unfortunately for all of you I am going to say more than one word but 
we're going to focus on that word Jesus. And I want to affirm what Bob said when he prayed this morning because you have preached my sermon in a nutshell this morning with what you said. So I'd like to affirm that and hold that in mind, what he said about Jesus giving us that word uh, to focus on, but also the fact that Jesus didn't come when he came to judge us, but actually that is yet to come. And we're going to look at that a little bit this morning. Now, uh, if you've got your Bible open, I will refer to parts of it, but the bits I'll refer to might be in a slightly different translation uh, to some of you, because I use the New Living Translation. Um, I always mean to pick up the NIV when I prepare a talk, but I always remember after I've typed half of it um, out. And this morning I had a slight problem in that I logged onto my computer, uh, and it came up with the login, put my password in, and it said user login failed. So I did that technical thing where you turn it off and turn it back on again, put my password in again, user login failed. So I thought, well, it can't. I've had the same password forever. So I got Trish to come and log in, thinking, just in case, I didn't tell her what, you know, she just logged in and it, it's a problem with it. So I've sent a screenshot of it over to a good friend of mine who's a computer uh, IT wizard and just put help. Um, but fortunately for me, I had backed it up to Google Drive. But I might refer back to that not being recognized a little bit later. Now, this story takes place, uh, if you know your Bible in the, in the scripture, it actually takes place after the temptation of Jesus. And very often when we read scripture, we read one chapter, then we read the next chapter, then we read the next chapter, we just sometimes assume, don't we, that it's one thing happens after another happens after another. A bit like when we watch a, a soap. Um, I'm not really into soaps as such, but uh, some of you might be into EastEnders or Coronation Street or Emmerdale, and they tend to just follow on, don't they? But actually with this passage of Scripture, there is, a, there is about a year's gap between when Jesus was tempted and actually when he went into the, the synagogue. And during this period of time, Jesus was uh, preaching, he was ministering, he was healing, he was showing people God. He was explaining to them that the kingdom of God has come, and he was going around doing the things that the Father had given him to do. And the reports about Jesus very quickly spread. If uh, somebody famous comes to an area, it very quickly becomes known that they're there. I can remember just a, a few weeks ago, it might have been a month or two ago now, um, a very excited young lady coming up to me at the end of the service with another very excited young lady to say that Justin Bieber was flying into, into Luton Airport, um, and, and could I take her up to the airport? Uh, to which I gave her the only suitable reply to a request like that, uh, no. Uh, purely and simply because there will just probably be loads of other people there, and he probably won't even come out of the main entrance. He'll be ushered into a limo at the back. But I'm not comparing Jesus in any way to Justin Bieber, but it's the same kind of thing. When people become famous, when people become well-known, word of mouth quickly gets round, doesn't it? And I think if, uh, if Jesus was around uh, in these days, it would probably happen even quicker because there would be uh, tweets and there would be Facebook uh, notifications and people would be doing Instagrams and there would be all sorts. But people were getting to know about Jesus very, very quickly. And the feel amongst the people was one of amazement. Here was this man that was giving sight to the blind. Here was this man that was healing people. And it wasn't just, you know, healing people of a, a cold or something. These were people that maybe hadn't walked, people that were lame, people that had deformities. God was working through Jesus in these ways. And uh, there was this feel amongst the people that, wow, this is exciting. You know, I want to I see this Jesus. But among the religious leaders of the time, there was a sense of fear developing. They didn't like what was happening. They didn't like Jesus coming. They didn't like this because their authority... You know, they were the go-to people uh, for religion. And all of a sudden, this, this man was coming along and he was teaching and he was doing things that they hadn't seen before, they weren't familiar with. And actually, isn't that just like today? Some people, when they hear about Jesus, they get so excited. I want to know more. I want to meet him. I want him in my life. And others are very kind of skeptical. They kind of miss the point of why Jesus came. Now, Jesus went uh, into the synagogue, and, and this was actually Jesus' hometown. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever been somewhere uh, where you haven't been for quite a, a long period of time, and you're returning back to it, but it can be quite surreal, can't it? Uh, in the summer of last year, I was invited to, to take an assembly at Chorney High School for Boys. 
um, a, a lady was at one of the primary schools I go to and she'd seen one of my assemblies and she said, you know, would you come and do that uh, at my school? And I said, where's your school? She said, Chorney. I said, I'd love to. That was my high school. That's where I grew up. That was, that was where I didn't do so well in GCSEs, but it, it, was a good, it was a good experience being at that school. And uh, I went back and I walked into the hall, into the main reception hall, and, uh, and I signed in. And it was like, it took me back. I was like, wow, I remember this. I remember that headmaster's office, uh, which, funny enough, was now a waiting room. Um, it wasn't a waiting room when I was there. It was just a little couple of chairs outside. You'd sit in and wait to see uh, the teacher, the head teacher. But it was surreal going back. And afterwards, they gave me a tour of the school. And you know what? It hadn't changed. It'd been painted, but it really hadn't changed. You know, the art block was now the maths block, but the actual building itself was almost untouched apart from a lick of paint. But Jesus walks in, and he's there, and he picks up at the scriptures, he picks up the scroll, and he says, the spirit of the Lord is on me. Michelle, sorry, can I just get that up on the, the screen? The spirit of the Lord is upon me. For the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Now that was written over 700 years before Jesus was born. It's a long time, isn't it? Anybody here know what it feels like, 700 years? I'm not going to make eye contact with anybody at this point, but 700 years is a very long time. And it was a prophecy. A prophecy is something foretold by God. And this was a prophecy about Jesus. Now picture the scene. In fact, maybe just close your eyes. Imagine that you are there. You have been in this synagogue. There would have been the religious leaders there. There would have been the the, uh, the people there. And all of a sudden, Jesus turns around and says, this scripture you have just heard has been fulfilled this very day. Now, if I was to say something this morning in the service, very, very controversial, okay, I'm not going to, but just imagine that I did. I can imagine instantly some of you would be kind of chattering and murmuring to the person next to you. Did he just say that? Can he say that in church? Okay. And there would be that real sense of, whoa, that, that's substance. And that's probably what it would have been like, but actually in a lot bigger way. Because Jesus was basically saying, I've come to fulfill this prophecy. I'm actually here to do what that says. And the people wouldn't have known how to take that. Some of them would have been, you know what, looking at what he's been doing, that might add up. I can just picture the religious leaders being all very kind of like, you know, hush, hush, oh, who does he think he is? How dare he say that? It would have been a sense of shock to some people. And the people must have been amazed and puzzled at the same time. The religious leaders certainly would not have been. And if we were to read a little further on, we would see that they literally mobbed Jesus. They literally grabbed him. They took him uh, to a hill, and they were going to throw him off. I'd encourage you later to read on. Read on a little bit more in the passage. But I just love what happened. You know, just pick, they've got Jesus. They're about to push him off this hill, and Jesus just walked straight through the middle of them. It would be like all of you guys not liking something I've said and just coming up the front and we're about to grab hold of me and throw me out of the church and I just casually just walk through all of you. And there's nothing you can do about it. I just walk through. Very often in scripture, there's little bits like that we kind of miss. That's quite, kind of a big deal. I don't know if you've ever been in a, a scene where it's a bit of a, a riot. Years ago, I went to a wedding um, that was at a nightclub. Um, and it was quite funny, actually, because we had a venue room at the back um, and when it came to be time to leave, we all left the nightclub um, and went through it. I was a young, innocent, 20-year-old. Uh, uh, was, this was all new to me, really. Honestly, it was. I was quite naive with things like that. And all of a sudden, just as Trish and her mum and her dad and her brother had walked through the doors at the front, a fight kicked off in the nightclub. I've never seen anything happen so quick. The bouncers just locked the place down. And I was still in it. And I was experiencing what it was like to be in a kind of scene that was quite riotous. And I was kind of thinking, and oh, this is interesting. Everyone I know is outside, and I'm inside with all this stuff kicking off. But mobs and things like that, they're scary situations. But Jesus just walked through the middle of them. People today still have this kind of skepticism, don't they, about Jesus. They either think 
he is this amazing moral teacher, or they believe his claim that he's the son of God. And I think C.S. Lewis um, said it best, and I'll read it to you. C.S. Lewis said, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to do. Now, I love C.S. Lewis. I think he says some amazing things. Um, and I think that, just in a nutshell, puts down what we need to know about Jesus. But what is interesting to note in this passage is that Jesus only quotes the first part of the passage in his Isaiah. He actually misses uh, part of it out. Okay, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. We read that bit. But the next bit, Jesus didn't put in. And the day of the vengeance of our God. Now, when Jesus said the first part, he'd come to fulfill that. He'd come to fulfill what was happened. But he stopped short of saying the day of vengeance of our God. He said, The Spirit of the Lord was on him. He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come. And Jesus, during Jesus' lifetime and Jesus' ministry, that's very much what he did. Now, we also know that one day, according to what it says in Scripture, according to what we know as Christians, Jesus is going to come back and he's going to take us to be with him. And there are some scriptures, uh, 2 Timothy says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. One day, Jesus is going to come back. And he's going to fulfill the second part of that prophecy. And as I was preparing uh, this week for this talk, I was going through it, I was reading the commentaries, I was praying, and I was saying, God, what do you want to say through this this morning? This is a fantastic passage. And I really, really felt, and I've been doing a lot of reading recently, and I've been seeing a lot of things that talk about how we need to preach the gospel. We need to preach Jesus. And if you read the Bible, whether you read the Old Testament or the New Testament, whichever part of it you read, the Old Testament always points forward to Jesus. Now, if, you, if you're one of those people that you read the Old Testament and you think, people tell me that, but how, how, how does it all piece together? Why, how does that fit with that? And how can I read something in Genesis and people tell me it's talking about Jesus as well? I would really encourage you. There's two books okay, that are fantastic to read. One is by Vaughan Roberts. Um, and it's called, it's the storyline. It's the storyline of the, of the Bible. Um, I've got notes of them, so if you want to get them, come and see me afterwards. Um, I've lent my copy out to a, to a good friend at the moment, but it's a fantastic one. And there's another one by Mike Pilavachi and Andy Croft, which is called God's Big, no, one's called Storylines, one's called God's Big Picture. But they give you an overview of the whole Bible and how it pieces together and points toward Jesus. And I would recommend actually anybody who's a believer to get one of those books and read them because it gives you a sense of what scripture is pointing towards and what scripture is all about. But one day Jesus is going to come back. And the reason that, that Jesus died on the cross, and the cross is something that even as Christians sometimes we don't like to talk about. I can remember, um, I think it was J. John did a little talk uh, once and he'd gone to a supermarket and the, and the young girl on the till had a, had a crucifix uh, hanging from her, from her cross, a little, a little cross, and it was gold and it was all nice and pretty and he said oh that's really nice are you a Christian and she said no 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 no. I just I just like the cross so J. John being J. John said oh well would you have had an axe hanging 
from your neck or maybe a guillotine. She went, of course I wouldn't. She said, he said, well, the, the, the cross is, a, is an act of, it's, it's an execution tool. Is it, she said. And, and he literally shared the gospel with her. Jesus died on the cross for you and for you and for you, for all of us. And without that death on the cross, why are we here? You know, we could be at home, a cup of coffee, newspaper, yeah, playing golf, going to watch the football. We may as well go and do one of those things because if we're not here because of what Jesus did, why are we here? And I want to challenge this morning, this is what God has really laid on my heart, that one day, and I'm not saying this to any individual now when I say this, but one day Jesus is going to come back and he's going to fulfill the second part of that prophecy. And there are going to be a lot of people who are going to be shocked and surprised and disappointed. Because just like when I went on my computer this morning, it said, use the profile not recognized. There are going to be those of us that are going to come before Jesus, and it's going to be a case of use a profile not recognized. Jesus won't recognize us. He won't know us. And we can't sit in church every week and think, well, I went to church every week. You know, I was on the T-rotor. They can't get anyone on the T-rotor, so I'm on the T-rotor. Okay? That's not going to help. You might serve at Mustard Seed Lunch Club religiously. You might be the first person there, the last person to leave. If you don't know Jesus, you're wasting your time. You're just doing some good on earth. That's good. I'm not, I'm not knocking doing good things. You might read your Bible every day. You might even believe a lot of what it says in there. If you don't know Jesus, it doesn't matter. It does not matter. If you have not come to that point where you have got down on your knees and you've said, God, forgive me. I want Jesus to be the center of my life. I want Jesus in my life. And I make everything else, not even a close second. If you've not got that relationship with Jesus Christ, one day you're going to stand before God and you're going to regret it. Because you're going to be going somewhere that the church doesn't like to talk about. Okay, and that's a four-letter word called hell. Okay? And we're not very good at talking about it in the church. And I'm not talking about Christ Church here, I'm talking about the church. Okay, the church nationally. I think actually in a lot of countries, uh, they are actually a lot better at talking about it. But we need to know Jesus, people. And if you don't know Jesus, don't put it off. Don't think because you sit next to a really faithful person in church that some of that will rub off. You know, I was talking to a friend this week who's a teacher and she said she loves her kids. <laughs> She'd put it as a Facebook profile. She said she just wished they wouldn't share her germs. You know, the germs that kids get a cold, teachers get it, don't they? And that. We can't, we don't rub off on you. Know, if I go and sit next to Mel and think, well, she's, you know, she's pretty godly. She's on the worship team. A little bit of that will rub off on me. So when I get to God, you know, stand before God, there'll be a little bit of Mel there and a little bit of me there. It doesn't work like that. We've got to know Jesus for ourselves. And if you don't know Jesus, if you don't know him for yourself, please, 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 before you leave here this morning, come and talk to someone. Speak to Dean, speak to me, speak to Glyn, anybody. Okay, I think even Glyn would allow that to be a pastoral issue you'd probably accept, okay, <laughs> before you start. But speak to someone you know knows Jesus. Because one day he's going to come back and you do not want to be stood before him. And I know people that are pretty mouthy and I've had conversations with people who've turned around and said to me, when I see God, I'm going to have so many questions for him. I'm sorry, no you're not. When you stand before God, you're going to be on your knees and there is nothing you will say to him other than to be worshipping him. But don't make it a regretful day. Don't make it a day that you think, why, I heard sermons, I read the scriptures I had the friend share the gospel with me why didn't I just accept it and I cannot say it enough because years ago I was given a vision and this was when I first started working with young people and, and I saw this picture and it was of an escalator and there was one escalator going up and there was one escalator going down and I was on the one going up because I knew I'd accepted Jesus but on the escalator going down were good friends of mine, unchurched friends of mine. And they were looking across to me and they were saying, why didn't you tell me? If you knew this, why didn't you tell me? Church, one day it's going to be too late. 
please, if you don't know Jesus, speak to somebody this morning you know does. And leave this church this morning. Leave this building, because that's all this is. This isn't the church. We are the church. This is a building. Leave this place knowing that you know Jesus and that, God forbid, anything happen to you tomorrow. We've all experienced things in the last few years, people who've died, people who've suddenly caught, uh, had, had cancer. We don't know what tomorrow holds. I don't know if you've seen, there was a nasty accident on Friday night. Drunk driver went through someone's garden. Fire brigade had to cut her out of the car. It's quite a mess. She's okay. We don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. But let's know that whatever tomorrow brings, when we're faced with Jesus, he will say, I know him, I know her. Amen.